how you prepare for a golf tournament? Uh, well, I um, hit balls maybe 20 minutes, putt a little bit, smoke four or five cigarettes, drink three Diet Cokes, and go to the first tee. Some days I won't even go to the range. All right, here we go. It's a Thursday edition of the Daily Puck Drop, the DPD. We are inside the Puck Sports Studios, built by Limbach Lumber, family owned and serving the Northwest since 1930, the Northwest premier supplier of specialized lumber and molding. Summer deck and fence season is here. So contact the folks there at uh, Limbach Lumber, 206-782-3487. Visit them online at limbacklumber.com. Puck Sports Studios built by Limbach Lumber. Go in there. Say hi to Paul. Say hi to Mark and Matt. Get those guys to uh, start working. But, again, if you want local uh, product, a great product, uh, family-owned, third-generation, no BS, no hassle, no nothing, right, except for good great, efficient help and work. Uh, visit the folks there at Limbach Lumber. Again, the Limbach Lumber Studios. All right, here coming up on a Thursday edition. Of course, we have uh, NFL uh, news and notes on a Thursday. That means Mike Garofolo of the NFL Network will join us. A little abbreviated uh, visit there with Mike. And one thing we're going to touch on Mike with, these rumors here in the last week about Jeff Bezos and, and the Seahawks. For some reason, it's garnered uh, more and more attention uh, kind of a slow time here in the NFL, so maybe that's why it's it's uh, it's been percolating a, a little bit with his uh, rumors of potentially buying the team or what have you. I know he sold a lot of stock, and I don't know if that means anything other than him selling stock. I would love for him to buy the Mariners. If there's one team that you could choose for him to buy, it would be the Mariners. I've always been curious to... Also, what his involvement potentially could be uh, with the NBA. We're going to touch on that in, in a quick second. Also, on a Thursday, we'll talk to Rob State and SeahawksDraftBlog.com. Uh, and uh, he's on a, a level 10 right now because his, uh, his, his English football team, all right, is in the uh, Euro Championships against Spain. So uh, we'll have to talk to uh, Rob a little bit about that. And then we'll get into uh, some Seahawks. Uh, news and notes as we are a week or two weeks away uh, from training camp uh, getting underway. In fact, camp starts in a few days here for the Ravens. They're, they're making the rookies come back early, which is just brutal, man. Uh, but, and we can celebrate. Um, it's a little too early for me to start uh, drinking champagne, but we can celebrate that Jamal Adams officially will not be coming back to the Seattle Seahawks. I know that had been at least talked about, and we spent many, many shows discussing whether or not Jamal Adams could return to the Seattle Seahawks because they would not, they being the Seahawks, would not shoot it down, that they always left the door open. But we'll give you an update on where Jamal Adams is going. We'll touch in on the M's again last night. I mean, they just won another close game. This is how they win games. This is how they do it. Uh, the Pac-2 media day was yesterday. Quick thought on that one. And then a quick thought on what the Big 12 is trying to do. And as we always do here on the Daily Puck Drop on the DPD, inside the Limbach Lumber Studios, we will finish with Hey, What the Puck? A story um, out of Vegas, a Minnesota State Fair story, uh, which I've been to. And then also uh, an update on a story that we talked on uh, last year uh, when we were on the radio. Uh, about funds being diverted from kids to pay for minor league parks, which and for minor league teams, which are owned uh, by professional franchises. And this one involves uh, your Seattle Mayor. So we'll touch on that one coming up on uh, Hey, What the Puck as we wrap up a Thursday edition of the Daily Puck Drop. Let's get right into it. NBA uh, is back in Seattle. It's a done deal. Uh, nothing official yet, but the 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 first hurdle, so to speak, or I guess, actually, let me back up. The last hurdle uh, that needed to be cleared uh, was their official, official announcement of the media deal. And that came yesterday. $76 billion over 11 years. ESPN, Amazon, NBC still don't know officially yet if TNT Turner is out or not. I think it'd be a great disservice. Quickly, let me just touch on this one. A great disservice, I think, for the NBA not so much not to have the games on Turner, but to not somehow, some way take care of what that show was inside the NBA with Ernie and Shaq and Kenny and, and Charles. Because 
I think a lot of why the league is popular, where they're at from a branding standpoint and a popularity standpoint has a lot to do with that show. A lot of people associate the NBA with that show. It is must watch television. Other networks watch it. Other personalities watch it. The league watches it. And I think the NBA, and I think a failure here real quickly by Adam Silver and the league would be to somehow not get a TV deal reached with them to protect that show. Because I think they they are a great ambassador for the league. They don't sugarcoat things. They tell you how it is. Uh, they promote the league, but they give honest, fair takes. I mean, it is so much better than what you get on ESPN. It, it just is so much better. I mean, ESPN's pregame and postgame and halftime show, it, it's just, uh, it, it's, abs- it's embarrassing how bad it is. It really is. And then how much money they spend on it. Uh, they, the, the beauty of inside the NBA is that it's not just an hour of hardcore. Let's break down the game. It's personality driven. Like all of these platforms should be, it's gotta be personality driven. If you don't like the personality of the person talking to you, you're not gonna like the show. So I hope it's somehow, uh, they can figure out a way to incorporate Turner back into it so they can be a part of this new uh, TV media rights deal. Because you know when, that, when the Sonics do come back here, whether it's a year, two years, or whenever it is, I'd like to be able to tune that show on, on Thursday and hear Barkley and hear Shaq and, and Kenny talk about uh, the NBA back in Seattle. So what's the lay? So what's next then? Well, Adam Silver had said, has said many times they're not just going to get the TV deal and then come right out right away and say, well, now we're expanding to these cities. He knows where they're going, okay? There is no secret in the NBA of where they're going to expand to. They're going to expand to two markets. Number one is Seattle, and number two is Vegas. I think the all that is left up for debate right now is when are they going to go uh, to Las Vegas? Tim Laiwiki, of course, who uh, built uh, part of OVG and, and built Climate Pledge up in Queen Anne, is a part of a group in Las Vegas trying to get another deal done or another arena done in Las Vegas and trying to build, I think it's off the strip, trying to build a huge complex with hotels and entertainment, all that kind of stuff. And I think another casino, but they haven't broken ground at, at all. And there's some thought there that they, because it's been delayed so much that it, that actually won't happen. That there's an, that there's other groups now trying to get uh, something done in Las Vegas. They could easily go with an unbalanced, uh, amount of teams. They don't have to have 32. They've, they've done it in the past. They clearly would prefer not to do that. They would like to bring two teams in at once, but the league has done it before. The NHL did it clearly with, ironically, Vegas and Seattle with Vegas going first. And then remember there was the delay in Seattle because didn't know where the where the arena was going to be or where, where everything was going to uh, you know, where they were actually going to place the team. In fact, remember they, they just gave the team to Vegas and, and Vegas started and then Seattle wasn't even a done deal yet. So they could do that. There are alternatives to Las Vegas arenas. There's like six or seven arenas there that can have an NBA team. Could they do it on an interim basis and have a team there? For sure. Who's going to own it? Who knows? I mean, the biggest the, the biggest speculation is it's going to be LeBron's group, uh, led the Fenway group who owns, you know, the Red Sox and then owns a, a couple of uh, European soccer teams, uh, but that LeBron wants to be a part of it there in Le- Las Vegas. They do all their business in Las Vegas, so it's going to happen. Will it happen right away? Who knows? Now, what's the timeline here in Seattle? Well, clearly, it's not going to be this year. Uh, those have speculated 26-27, and maybe that is the the exact timeline if you want Vegas to come in there with them. I do believe, and maybe I'm just optimistic, I'm going to hold out hope because it's what I prefer. I still think there's a time frame where it starts in 25, 26, and they could could do it. They could easily put the idea that this group, whoever is ever going to own the Sonics, hasn't put together the, the foundation, organizational structure of the team is, come on, is really short sighted. I mean, they've got the ownership group already in place. You just probably don't know all the particulars. We don't know all the particulars that would be involved. David Bonderman clearly is going to be one of the main people, worth over $6 billion, I believe. Now he's going to need some help 
because this this expansion fee is going to be probably north well it's going to be north of four billion maybe closer to five we shall four and a half so he's going to have to get people on board uh with him as well i think the Ackerleys will probably be a part of it how much a part of it i think the in a weird way the irony of the Ackerleys being involved in it is part of the reason that we're in this situation is because uh they did kia on the cheap back in the day so whatever but I always, I'm not going to trash Key Arena because I always liked it. I did. I never thought it needed to really be upgraded. I liked how intimate it was and small it was and the concourse and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I've always had good memories of Key Arena. But uh, the Ackerleys uh, being involved, uh, Jassy, the the CEO of Amazon, potentially uh, being involved. He's, his net worth is only uh, half a million dollars. But, again, just a, you know, a minority owner. You can mention all the athletes that are associated with the Kraken and all that. We'll get into a story here with Jeff Bezos coming up later with the Seahawks. I'm curious what what his interest would be. I'm curious if you would reach out to him and ask him. He can own two different teams. He does, he, there's no, nothing that prevents him from owning the Seahawks and then a, a piece of, 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 of the Sonics. So I'm hopeful that it's 25-26. And there should be, and we've said this many, many times before, an announcement sometime at the end of this year. Uh, before two, uh, 2024 is over, uh, the announcement uh, could happen, and certainly could happen before that. And I think that they could, they could get the the people in order, the front office in order. I'm sure they've already have a list of who they want to hire. Communication side, the communication side of it is is pretty much done. Uh, you know, the PR and, and the, all those people, because uh, they've already the crack and have, have repositioned people. They've created another kind of like shell company within the whole kind of Kraken arm uh, of owning the of the the franchise and, and have created really an NBA wing of it. Yeah, you're talking front office. Uh, we are talking um, coaches and all that kind of stuff. So, and, and this is the exciting time. So when it finally does get uh, announced, you know, who do you go after? I, I'm going to tell you right now, the number one person I would go after right now, as we sit here on July 11th, of 2024, and if money is no option, because I do believe if you own this team, you, you've you got to get off to a good start. Well, I mean, there's going to be a honeymoon phase with here with the Sonics. It's not going to be like the Kraken. But you want to you want to come out on top, right? And you want, you want the best. You want the very, very best to run this organization. Now, it's going to take a lot. He probably will not leave. Okay, because of all the success that they have had and the culture he has built. But the number one person I would I would go after right away to see if you could pry him away would be Eric Spolster of the Heat. And I would tell Eric Spolster this. You you uh you run the team, all of it. You're the head coach, but really we want you to oversee all of the basketball operations, the entire thing. We want you to bring that heat culture, the culture that you have built along with Pat Riley, we want you to bring it to Seattle. You can then oversee all of the basketball operations, build it from the ground up. You're not inheriting anything, but we want you to build your best version, your version of what a basketball team should look like. Coach the team for a few years and then move on and hand it to somebody else. But then you transition to the role of what Pat Riley is for the Heat. You know, what Brad Stevens has done with the Celtics. You transitioned into that role. That's the, If we're going to do start our, our wish list, I'm going to get a head start on everybody here, a two-year head start on everyone. And my wish list is Eric Spolster of the Heat. He's unbelievable. Great basketball mind, great culture. The players relate to him. He has built up enough equity in this sport to, I think, be demanding, especially in this culture with with the NBA players and how much power they have. Um, He doesn't seem to be phased by that. I think it would just be a great – you want to talk about a splash hire. I mean, it's it's like when the Seahawks went out and grabbed Mike Holmgren. He was the best top person on the market. They went out and grabbed him. So that's what – if we're going to do a wish list right now, uh, my wish – and number one on that list is Eric Spolster. You chime in at the, at the bottom. Who do you want? 
And here's another reason why I want them to start right away, because we could get Cooper flag. Now we don't automatically get the number one pick, but I don't know what the the exact lottery system on, on that one is, but I don't know, maybe something in God's graces could get us Cooper flag uh, coming up next year, but 25, 26, um, I'm fingers crossed on that one. I know a lot of people feel it's 26, 27, but I do believe 26, 27, just to, to wrap it up is more based on Vegas having to be a part of it right away. So I, I just wouldn't completely shut the door in 25, 26 people want to, but I, I wouldn't do it. All right. So that's the latest uh, with the NBA, that last hurdle cleared before you get the official announcement. I guess there's going to be one more hurdle. that's going to sit there and say, now we're going to open it up to all these cities, but just again, there are two cities, right? There's one and then 1A, Seattle and then Las Vegas. Uh, let's uh, transition over to the uh, Mariners' defense on point last night for the M's. Uh, they went a close one, two to nothing uh, there over the San Diego Padres, so they sweep the Padres down in San Diego. Ty France, uh, great defensive play uh, early in that game. This game was defined by uh, defensive plays. Julio Rodriguez with the bases loaded when that game early on. You know, when they were just uh, nursing that one nothing lead, comes up with that great catch there. And, well, not great catch, but the, the double play, the throw home, uh, which is just a very awesome throw. Great defensive play there by Julio. He struggled at the plate, but that was just a beautiful textbook. Get behind the ball, throw it home, two hopper, great tag by Cal. Didn't have to move, uh, runner out there at home. And then, of course, uh, JP's play to end the game. I mean, how many times do you see a ball like that, little soft little liner, get over the head of the both the second baseman and the shortstop uh, for the game-winning run, which, of course, would have uh, tied the game. But great play there by J.P. Crawford. Good job by uh, Andres Munoz. Kind of clean up his own mess that he was doing out there. Uh, but he was able to survive. Good to see it. Good series win. And just dominant pitching performance uh, by these guys and why they will be such a force if they can just get into the playoffs because the pitching dominated uh, in this brief two-game series against the Padres. That's a top-five offense in the National League. Average, run scores, OPS, all of it. And they held that team in a two-game series to three runs and a total of 10 hits. And coming into it, they were on fire offensively. So it's the old cliche that, that great pitching will always top uh, great hitting. And that certainly was the, the case here in the last two games. Oh, my God. Everyone's – look what Polanco's doing now after he said he was over. Yeah, I'll still – good. I'm glad he's hitting. They need him to hit. But it's still over for him. I mean, we may eat our words at the end of the year. That That's fine. But I'm not going to overreact to a, two games in which he had – one, two legit hits in the series. So he also committed an error on a routine ball. All right. So before we start doing the parade for Polanco, let's just, let's give it some time. It's the same group that want to do, you know, wanted, um, you know, do the parade for Julio a little bit. I mean, Julio back, you know, comes out after that, having that ph phenomenal game in game one, we had four hits and he looked great. He strikes out four times yesterday. So, I mean, the baseball, man, and hitting ebbs and flows up and down. It's a roller coaster. And this team is a roller coaster. We have a roller coaster for the, the, the remaining games here in the season. Uh, they struck out 13 times uh, last night. That was awesome. So their double digits to strikeouts now is to uh, 14 games now, uh, which is uh, broken a Major League Baseball record, which they set themselves a year ago. And uh, so it's just the... <laughs> Offensively, it's a hard watch sometimes with these guys. It really is. It's just a hard watch to see a team and their inability to put the ball into play. But good news is they got the win, maintaining their lead there in the American League West. It was good to see um, uh, Bryce Miller last night because Bryce Miller has really struggled on the road. Um, and, is, and like tonight's starter there as well, coming up with uh, with uh, Luis Castillo, really struggled on the road. But, boy, looked good last night. Did it in a weird way, too. Last time that Bryce Miller has struck out one batter. 
And he said that he doesn't believe he's ever had a game where he has not struck someone out, and he can't even recall a game in which he only had one strikeout. But that was the case yesterday there for uh, Bryce Miller. But good for him against that offense uh, in that park. And knowing what his record was, what his track record was here on the road, to be able to bounce back like that and have a great uh, a great outing was was a really good sign there uh, for Bryce Miller and the M's. Cal Raleigh joined an exclusive club uh, yesterday. 15 home runs, five steals uh, there before the All-Star break. He joins Carlton Fisk, Johnny Bench, and Yvonne Pudge Rodriguez, the only catchers in Major League Baseball history uh, to do that. That was just pretty damn cool there. Uh, for Cal Raleigh, he continues to have just a a, a real, real solid, solid season uh, for the Mariners. And we've talked a, a lot about this with Divish, with Brad Adam, um, with Bill Kruger. Is that, you know, of all the guys on the baseball team, and I don't think there's anyone that's going to sit there and tell you that he's the best player. Um, and I know it's a, we've mentioned this many times before, but he is the most important player on the team. And and why still we have not reached some type of contract extension with him. Now, again, it takes the player, and then his agent is Scott Boris, but something has got to be done with Cal Raleigh because the one thing that makes you a little bit nervous, and, I, and it makes me nervous too, but I, I still would deal him. If you deal, if you do deal Harry Ford, you're going you're gonna to trade your future catcher without knowing whether or not Cal's going to be on the baseball team, whether he wants to stay here full-time. I, I don't know if he does. Only Cal does. I mean, I'm sure he likes the pitchers. I'm sure he loves the organization. But, you know, at, at some point, he's going to be want he's going to want to be taken care of. And he's going to be want, he wanted to be taken care of in a big way and a lot of money. And will, will this team invest in him? And maybe to be fair to them, to be fair to the front office, to be fair to ownership, maybe they have. Maybe they've presented him something. Now, we've heard no rumors about it, but maybe they presented him an offer that he just looks at and goes, it's not good enough. Or Boris, his agent, says, no, we'll play it out. But he's not a free agent for, God, a few more years. I think it's 2028. It's like four more years before he gets to free agency. He'd probably be wise to take a deal now and then get to free agency. I mean, take a smaller deal maybe or or lock it up to an eight, nine, ten-year deal, I, whatever. I just don't want the guy to leave. Uh, the average I don't think will ever be that low. Divis talked about it yesterday. I mean, he'll, he'll, he'll get that average up. He could, he could easily be a two, 240 guy if he could get there. And I know we're setting kind of the bar low now uh, with these players, but the game has changed so much in terms of average. But the power is there. The defense is there and the leadership is there. He just, again, there's very few catchers in this sport that are as good as him defensively, the leadership qualities that he possesses, and then the power he possesses and being a switch hitter, uh, which we saw on display in game one. So whatever they can do to resign that guy, I, mean, I don't want to lose him. And it would just be heartbreaking, man, if they, they end up trading Harry Ford and then they find out they can't resign Cal Raleigh and they lose Cal Raleigh. I mean, this is, you know, this organization after Dan Wilson void, right, of, of any good catchers. How many catchers did this organization go through? They finally found a guy, and it took him a long time uh, with Cal Raleigh. Don't let him, uh, don't let him slip through. Uh, some bad news there from Dom Canzone. He's on the uh, DL abductor strain. They brought up Jonathan Classe uh, from Tacoma. Divish and I thought maybe it would be Cade Marlowe, but they went with Classe instead. Uh, the other news is Brian Wu, who, was, uh, who has been uh, – uh, knocked out here for a few weeks. He's back. He's going to start on Friday against the Angels. And, of course, they start that uh, game tonight against the Angels. Luis Castillo will be on the mound this evening. Our bet M's under summer tour continues. We bet on the under of every single Mariners game. We won last night because it was 2-0. Uh, we're 29-32-2 on the season. On the road here tonight for Castillo, uh, much like Miller, has been a, a problem. You know, all these pitchers have had their problems on the road. I think Gilbert's been on the only one that hasn't had as many issues, but Castillo who has, I think around a two, six, two, seven ERA at home, four, five, nine on the road. And then the angels are going to go with, I'm going to try and pronounce this guy's name, but I'm going to butcher it. Jack Kochenowitz. 
I, that's not even close. It's not even close. Uh, he is uh, making his major league debut tonight uh, for the Angels. So they should beat this guy up. I mean, even though they don't got much on him, not a strikeout thrower, just reading up on him on MLB.com. He uh, puts the ball in play. Uh, again, doesn't wipe anybody out. So this could be a game uh, tonight where the Mariners could uh, really tee off. So maybe, I don't know, maybe don't bet on the under. This, this, You know what? I'm just going to admit it right now. This is going to be an over one tonight. We're going to take an L. Uh, this evening, uh, but that's uh, that's it uh, for the Mariners again. Castillo on the mound uh, tonight for Seattle. Uh, we mentioned this before. Jeff Bezos is he positioning to buy the Seahawks? It's been for the last week for some reason on social media and internet has been like rampant speculation uh, that he is going to buy the team or he's selling a bunch of stock. I mean, it, nothing new. I mean, it's it's in the last year that he sold a bunch of stock. Uh, why he sold the stock, I don't know. Is he positioning himself to buy the Seahawks? Who knows? He doesn't live here anymore anyways. Uh, moved down to Florida. That doesn't mean that he can't own the team. But it's out there in the ether. He has sold something around 13 close to $14 billion worth of stock. Clearly, he is interested in the NFL. Amazon Prime has got Thursday night football. So there's that. He was interested in buying the Commanders. We'll talk to Garofolo about it on, on today's episode, on Thursday's podcast with Garofolo. He's probably going to say what? That the Commanders weren't sold to him because Daniel Snyder didn't want to sell it to him because Bezos owned the post, and the post would constantly go after uh, Dan Snyder. But the Commanders were a team that he was interested in purchasing. There were also some rumors about Denver way back in the day that he could possibly jump in there, but no, nothing happened with that, obviously. Six billion dollars is what the Commanders were sold for. Uh, the Seahawks right now currently valued at five billion dollars. Now, what's the what? What does Jody Allen? What's the time frame of Jody Allen and Burt Cold and all these guys? I want to say because there's real conflicting reports on this one. I, I want to say it's 2028 that it has to be sold by. Now, something in this past spring that went by could impact whether or not she does sell. Now, again, according to the trust, I mean, she's not the owner. She's just the overseer of the trust. According to the trust and the will left by Paul Allen, she is required to liquidate all of his assets, including that team. Now, she's just holding out uh, for the longest period of time, but at some point, we, she's going to have to get rid of the team unless now, somehow she can get a lawyer to change the language or or make it possible for her to keep it. But this past May on May uh, 2024, if they were sold prior to May of 24, 10% of the sale goes to the state. So that obviously expired. So now it makes it easier uh, for her to sell it. And then, of course, uh, the profits that come uh, with that. But it's not like that she has been a bad owner. I mean, I think NFL owners are pretty, you don't hear much from them at all. I mean, the only owners that you ever hear from is the Cowboys and Jerry Jones, because he's not only the owner, but he, but he runs the football team. He runs all like the football operations side of things. And then the other guy you always hear of is the, the guy in Carolina because he's crazy. So I don't, you know, the NFL owners don't have really much of a hands-on uh, with the team. And if Bezos were to buy it, you know, I don't know what upgrades can you make. You got a salary cap in the NFL. Uh, but the league, and I'm sure Gary Fuller will tell us this uh, later today uh, when that podcast comes out, the league wants him a part of it. They want anybody who is worth the amount of money that he is worth to be a part of the uh, of the NFL and part of the league. The throwbacks, it was announced yesterday by the CX, the throwbacks are back. They're going to wear them against the uh, Niners week three Thursday night football. We're going to talk to Rob Staten about this on SeahawksDraftBlog.com. Uh, uh, when we record the episode with him that will come out later today. We don't know why these aren't the permanent uniforms. They should be the permanent uniforms. Hey, Chuck Arnold, go Cougs. Just do it, please. For those who don't know, Chuck, he runs the president of all things, Seahawks business side of things. Will you please just go permanent to the to the Royal Blues? Everybody wants it. No one wants the old uniforms or these the uniforms they currently have. Go back to the originals. For the love of God, everybody wants it. Just do it. Look how pretty and great they look. We're begging you. Seahawks Nation is begging you to change them. You know what they're not begging? 
I know well, maybe some of you were, but I know I wasn't. Not begging to have Jamal Adams back. And you know what? He's not coming back. He signed a deal today with the uh, Tennessee Titans, so he's out. So grab yourself a cocktail and celebrate that you will not have to see number 33 in a Seahawks uniform. And I know Rob Staten is going to celebrate because his worst off-season nightmare was the possibility that the Seahawks would bring uh, Jamal Adams back. Uh, over to college football, it was... I don't know what word to use to describe the Pac-2 media day. And I just keep coming back to, I really want to say pathetic, sad. Yesterday in Vegas, if you didn't know, it was, it's the media day. Everyone's having media day. I think Mountain West had their media day. Big 12 was like day two. And then the Pac-2, Oregon State and Washington State held a media day. It was like a cocktail party. They invited people and the mascots were there. The coaches were there. Players were there. I, it just was sad. It was sad for many reasons. Sad that there's no longer a Pac-10, Pac-12 conference. It's sad that you see these other you know teams having media day in the Big 12, and not so much Colorado, but you know Utah and and Arizona and Arizona State, and, and their future, at least as of now, is secure. And and then you know obviously you, we're going to see the Big 10 coming up. Was it next week? I believe, and you're going to see the West Coast schools and. That one's going to probably sting a little bit more when you when you see those helmets up there and just the great tradition that those schools had when they were in this conference. But so it's sad for that because the uncertain future, what it means for the Beavers and what it means for for the Cougs and two good football programs. You know that you know not historically great. No one's no one's trying to tell you that, but good runs, good solid programs, good solid fan bases. That you know if whatever the future is here of college athletics good chance they go to the wayside and uh, that would be just it's terrible for the sport I believe to not have those two be a part of it um but so it's sad on that front it was sad to just sit there and see the two mascots up there it was sad to hear Teresa Gold who is the uh the commissioner right now of the of the Pac-12 and coming out there and saying if anyone deserves to drink it's the Pac-12 and we're drinking tonight it just was a and there was a lot of bitching and moaning coming out of it complaining and I, I don't know I just I'm not sure what they were supposed to do uh, I get what they were trying to do uh, but it was it was mocked <laughs> mocked by a lot of people who cover the sport not much how much attention really was focused on them uh, it didn't seem like many many national people wrote about it so if they were trying to garner some type of sympathy I don't think they really got it uh, but I think the number one thing both programs need to do this year have to do, they have to win. They have to win in a big way. Both the Beavers and the Cougs have got to win in a big way. They can't have disappointing seasons. They can ill afford to have a mediocre football season. If they do these other conferences, if there are any conferences interested in them, we'll just be like, see why, why would we want to add that? You know, if, if I'm the Big 12, Brett Yormark, why would, why would we want to add that? They Look at them. They're a six-win team, a seven-win team in the Mountain West. They'd get killed in the Big 12. Uh, speaking of the Big 12, they, I mean, they're going after Clemson. They're going after Florida State. There is a rumor now, speculation, they're trying to go after Miami and Notre Dame. So they're trying to get Florida State, Clemson, Miami, and Notre Dame trying to use private equity to accomplish all that. I'll say, say this about that Brett Yormark guy. You want somebody to lead your organization. You want somebody to, that is just going to step on the throats and step on everyone to get what he wants and the best for the, the company, the entity he works for. That's your guy. That is your guy. Boy, if they do that, that's a hell of a coup, man. Hell of a coup. If they can somehow pull off Clemson, Florida state, Miami, uh, and Notre Dame. All right, let's uh, wrap up the daily puck drop with uh, Hey, What the Puck? Concerning story coming out of uh, Modesto. Uh, this came out last night. The Mariners are leaving Modesto because they couldn't reach a new agreement on a lease and stadium upgrades. The M's uh, back in the day were partial owners of this team back in 2016. They took over full ownership in 2020. Um, and there's a lot of fans there of the nuts in that community that are upset. And the city's like, they want like $30 million in Stadium upgrades. Sound familiar? Tacoma, Pasco, uh, Everett, 
Spokane, this is this is the story we talked about a year ago. This is when we had the Mark Mullet on from the Senate. This is what is happening. These professional franchises, because Major League Baseball handed down a few years ago under the New Deal that these minor league parks needed to, needed to come up to Major League Baseball standards. And so this is why Mark Mullet and his cronies took all that money from that state fund. It was $45 million that was earmarked for fields in in the Seattle surrounding areas to improve them, baseball and softball. So when you have the folks down there at Lower Woodland Park who are trying to start a GoFundMe page and raise money to turf those fields because all the high school softball teams who all in the city all play there, but they consistently can't play there because of the rain. I know people have their issues with turf, and you got to get over it. It rains here during the baseball season. So it's either you turf them or don't turf them and, and don't play. I'd rather see the kids play. Um, and But the reason they've got to start raising their own money is because Mullet and these idiots in the Washington State Senate and House took the money away from them and 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 diverted it to these other teams in our state. $24 million was diverted of the $45 million that was earmarked for kids to improve kids' fields, not professional fields, because they are professional teams. And some of them, they're all affiliated with professional teams. Some of them are owned uh, by these professional teams, including uh, the Modesto Nuts, who are owned by the Mariners. And the people rightfully so, uh, rightfully so down there are angry, and they're angry towards the Mariners. They're like, you guys want us, a struggling community and city, to come up with $32 million for these upgrades, which the city just couldn't do and wouldn't do. And thus the Mariners are going to pull Modesto out of there, going to pull the nuts out of Modesto. And the people down there are going, but you guys are worth like over $2.2 billion. Why can't you do it? This is what I don't understand about the Mariners and all these other professional franchises, Uh, Spokane, which is um, the Rockies and then tri cities, which are the angels. These are your teams, whether you are directly affiliated with them or indirectly affiliated with them. They're yours. There's When you draft players or sign players, that's where you put them. Why wouldn't you invest in it? It's your team. It's your product. That's real disappointing here. Uh, a long list of things I think this organization does that bothers me. This is one of them, and it doesn't affect the on-field right now of where they're at. But I, I would love just to ask John Stan and their ownership group, why don't you just help them? Why? Especially because you own the team. I just don't get it. I just, I really don't understand it. And and I'm glad for the, for that city to stand up to them. Good for them. They're millionaires. And bi- I mean, he's a billionaire and he can't help them out. He can't fund the, the stadium upgrades there. Um, and I would just wonder if it's the same thing could potentially happen here. Could you have the same fate for the Aqua Sox and Rainiers? Aqua, Aqua Sox is tr- are trying to get uh, upgrades. The city's been resistant to it. County's been resistant to it. Um, again, there was $24 million that was earmarked, 24 or $45 million that was supposed to go to kids. That, that has been placed back into these teams, including Tacoma, Everett, Pasco, Spokane, but they still, in addition to that, need help. And a lot, and all of those teams are asking those cities or those counties to pay for it rather than the big league clubs. And if they can't do it, the threat is that they'll leave. So we'll see what the future is of the Everett Aqua Sox or, for that matter, of the Rainiers. Uh, what, and if they don't get the all, then I think the Rainiers got it. I think they've got the necessary upgrades now, but I Everett does not. All right. Uh, Let's see, what do we got? Oh, the Arkansas uh, story coming out of Las Vegas. There's an Arkansas tourist, <laughs> this is a great story, who is suing a Las Vegas stripper for $38.5 million after he says he was tricked into thinking that they were in an exclusive romantic relationship for 10 years. He claims he gave her cash and gifts totaling $3.5 million. Everybody's got this buddy, right? If you've ever went to a gentleman's club who thinks that that gal is interested in them and that they really, truly find themselves in love. I had like years and years and years ago when I would go to these, I had a buddy just like that. 
and you know who you are. You really thought they were into you, but they were not. It's part of their gig, bud. So I don't think he's going to get the $38.5 million. What do you think? I don't think that Arkansas guy is going to win this one. Not quite sure, but $3.5 million over 10 years? Jesus. Must have been a hell of a lap dance, I'll tell you that. Minnesota State Fair. You ever been? One of the greatest state fairs of all time. Okay, they are famous for everything. The rides, everything's bigger, and they deep fry everything. One time I went there, I saw, that was the first time I saw a deep fried uh, butter, and uh, the first time I saw a deep fried Oreo, which did not have the butter, tried the Oreo, it was terrible. But they've got something new this year at the Minnesota State Fair. Deep fried ranch dressing. I don't even know how you do that. How do you actually deep fry the dressing? I saw a picture of it. There's got to be some way they can do it, but that's odd. Um, I'm not going to lie. I don't love ranch dressing, but I like it. I bet you it's sneaky good. What does it say about us that we have to deep fry everything and deep fry ranch dressing? Is that over the line? Have we reached it now? As we finally peaked of deep frying things, what's the next step? Oh, I'll tell you what's really good at the fair. I had it there too for the first time in Minnesota. The deep fried pickle, that's not bad. That's not bad. Uh, but deep fried ranch dressing, I like the method of the madness, how they could pull that off. Oh, I don't know. All right, that's it for uh, Hey, What the Puck. Also, should uh, mention coming up tomorrow, uh, the voicemails. We'll play the best voicemails of this week. We've got, um, and uh, we're playing from Jim Moore because Jim it will be back on Friday. He does Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays uh, with us here on the Daily Puck Drop. Uh, Friday's going to be interesting. He's going to be a Roach Harbor. We'll see how he pulls this one off. Uh, but we're going to play the voicemails tomorrow. And I can tell you, we have an old friend uh, that that sent one in yesterday. An old friend who is back uh, at Dino's. Can't wait for that one. So the voicemail line is open. Go to pucksports.com, upper right-hand corner. You'll see it there. The phone number is 425-577-7272. Uh, 425-577-7272. It's on the website, pucksports.com. You can see it there. All right, that's a Thursday edition of the Daily Puck Drop. Coming up later, Mike Garofolo of the NFL Network, also Rob Staten from SeahawksDraftBlog.com. But the Daily Puck Drop, the DPD, in the books from the Puck Store, uh, Puck Sports Studios, uh, built by Limback Lumber. And again, uh, summer season is here for your fence and deck, okay? Go trust the fine folks there at Limbach Lumber. Uh, visit them at limbacklumber.com. Give them a phone call at 206-782-3487. Free delivery uh, within the Seattle area. And uh, they've been doing it since 1930, man. Same family. Same family since 1930. So go check them out at Limbach Lumber. Puck Sports Studios built by Limbach Lumber. Again, Garofolo, Staten coming up later uh, as well. Uh, talking NFL and all things Seahawks. So until then, we promise to be better. No shirt, no shoes, no dice. No. Would anybody like to smoke some pot? Yeah. I was born to love you. I was born to lick your face. I was born to rub you. But you were born to rub me first. What do you need my address for? We'd like to send out a mailer. <laughs> Mother of mercy, I don't speak Japanese! <laughs>